in with the entire Motor Week crew, and we're at Charlotte Motor Speedway to kick off a week-long North Carolina Festival of Speed. It starts tomorrow. Charlotte hosts round seven of the Camel GT Series. You're going to see it live beginning at 12.35 Eastern Time. Sports car racing's biggest stars doing battle in their 180-mile-an-hour prototype cars for a grueling 500 kilometers, and you won't miss a moment of it here on TBS Sports. Next week, the stock cars move in here at Charlotte to prepare for their Memorial Day run for a million dollars. And Chris Economaki is going to have more on the World 600 a little later on. Right now, let's review this afternoon's action here at Charlotte. We go to the GTO and GTU class highlights. Start of the race. Wally Dallenbach Jr. in a Mustang is the first to take the lead. He moves around Dennis Ossie's Toyota number 98, and he's the new leader. But didn't last very long. Big crash coming up front straight away. John Jones in for Dallenbach. Breaks early. Ossie hits him from behind, and there go the leaders. That turns the advantage over to another of the Mustangs. Lynn St. James climbs out during the yellow flag leading. Bruce Jenner gets in, but immediately Jenner gets in trouble. Float of the day, never send a man out to do a woman's job. Jenner crashing out of the lead and opening the door for Danny Smith in a Mazda number 53. He comes home with the first victory of his career this afternoon here at Charlotte. Now, as Charlotte gears up for a week of speed, the preliminaries to the 69th Indy 500 are winding down. Jerry Garrett will be patrolling pit road here tomorrow. He's been up at Indy. Jerry, what's the latest from up there? At Indy, it's been a tense week for drivers yet to qualify, but a tough week for two who already have. Here's Kevin Cogan crashing after a blown engine. And here's Danny Ongaia spinning nose first into the same wall. Neither driver was hurt, and after a lot of work, they say that their cars will be repaired in time to make the race. Well, time is running out on those drivers who would like to earn one of the few spots remaining in the Indianapolis 500 field. There's an hour and a half left today, and then a short session tomorrow, and that's it. This is the man on the hot seat, Derek Daly, the slowest man in the field. He'll be the first to be bumped once the field is full. Daly is getting ready his backup car now, just in case. Right now, just one spot remains in the tentative 33-car lineup. Then Indy's complicated bumping process begins. There have been three qualifiers so far today. Brazilian driver Raul Bosell is the fastest, followed by Chip Ganassi in one of A.J. Foyt's backup cars and Johnny Parsons. Parsons is replacing Jacques Villeneuve, who went home after three crashes that shook his confidence. The next qualifier should be John Paul Jr. sometime in the next hour. He hopes to make his run a successful one and return to race at Charlotte tomorrow. Any later word on that Paul situation, we'll bring it to you at the end of the program. We have some great motorcycle action today, beginning with the granddaddy of the stadium races, the 14th annual Super Bowl of Motocross. We begin with the 125cc division, decided with this last lap maneuver. Second place man, Rodney Barr, goes inside on leader Larry Brooks and goes on his head. Brooks, the winner. And in the feature class, mm, the 250 riders suffering lots of ungainly mishaps. Johnny O'Mara, national supercross champion among those eating the dirt. Ricky Johnson was spectacular in winning one of two heats, but he later crashed. Ron Lachine won the other, but he fell off too. And all that opened the door for Grand National Champion number one, David Bailey. He flew around and over the competition. That's his first overall win of the year. But with only one race left in this series, these two contenders for the national championship are the story. Keep an eye on point leader Jeff Ward, number two, as he puts a great pass on Brock Glover in race two. But a first race crash had left Jeff sixth overall, and the runner-up Glover now moves within just one point going to the series finale. Well, I'm just going to go for it as hard as I can. There's no way I can't. Uh, we got a lot of money on line and a Supercross championship, which I've never had before, and uh, I want it. I'll say he does. The week before that race, P.T. Barnum-style promoter Mike Goodwin, who runs the Super Bowl, was in the process of selling out and retiring. Last Saturday night, he changed his mind since the rumor started and frankly the negotiation started no deals done until the check clears the bank right and uh, I've had some second thoughts there are some uh, key points in the negotiations frankly that we haven't come to agreement on and in watching tonight's event and getting my blood pumping again and having some sponsors tell me not only it wouldn't be the same without me here but they might you might say uh, reinforce the fact that they want me to stay by upping their uh, their financial involvement. I believe you'll find that I, I may be involved more than I planned on a week ago for a long time. 
Well, Goodwin's improved financial condition will be good news for the riders who have long maintained that more of Mike's money should go into the purse. Here at Charlotte, Al Holbert has the ball for tomorrow's Camel GT, which you'll see live on TBS Sports, and we're going to hear from him right after this. We're live at Charlotte Motor Speedway, where Ken Squire will host tomorrow's live TBS coverage of the Camel GT, and Ken has the story of a new track record here. Al Holbert shattered the old mark yesterday, Dave. He and co-driver Derek Bell will start from the pole tomorrow. Derek Bell spun the low and brow Porsche 962 in practice, then spun it right back around a kept on trucking, and there was no harm done. Then Holbert upped the track record by more than three miles an hour to take the pole from John Paul Jr. Here's the rest of the top five. Al climbed out figuring that was as fast as he could go. Uh, each time a race car driver comes in off the racetrack, he thinks that he got it all. Uh, when you sit back uh, and think about it for a while, you know that it can't possibly be all. It's because if it were, why would you keep on doing it? Uh, the idea is to see how much quicker and how much better you can make it. So um, today, at this moment, I think that was about it. Uh, Ken will be back a little later with more on the race. And for Derek Bell, this could be the second big payday in a row for him here at Charlotte. Derek and teammate Hans Stuck ran second in Sunday's World Endurance Championship race. The Lanches qualified close to 150 miles an hour at Silverstone, while the Porsches ran a conservative save fuel race. Classic tortoise and hare story. The Lanches had trouble, while the Porsches just motored around. Winner Jackie Ick says these cars are so limited on fuel, the only way to win is not to race. He didn't and led another Porsche sweep. Fuel economy is one of the issues we'll talk about in this week's edition of the Beatrice Formula One Report. First, though, we want to take a look at the qualifying results for tomorrow's Monaco Grand Prix. Ayrton Senna, who lost at San Marino when he ran out of fuel, has won his third straight pole. That's a record speed. Nigel Mansell on the outside of the front row. American Eddie Cheever had a great run to fourth spot. Teo Fabi's going to start 20th in that race for the Tolman team, which hasn't raced all year. This week, Tolman bought out the Spirit team and got Spirit's Pirelli tires in the deal. You can't race Formula One without tires or without fuel. And that's the subject of this commentary filed by Jim Roller. San Marino Grand Prix provided vivid evidence that fuel restrictions are a bad way to limit car performance and promote safety. What should have been a battle to the end between Ayrton Senna and Elaine Prost ended when Prost backed off to save fuel. Senna raced on and ran out of fuel. He could have slowed and saved his fuel, but Stefan Johansson was trapped. His inspired drive from 15th place ended with a dry tank. You can't come from the back of the pack without charging, and it's sad the rules deny a charger a chance to race for the win. If the goal is truly to limit horsepower, Get rid of turbocharging. It will reduce power and costs. Formula One is supposed to be the pinnacle of motorsports, not an economy run where victory goes to the man with the lightest foot. And now we move from the pavement to the dirt and check out the USAC sprint car standings. 84 champ Ricky Hood won big, or rather leads big, after Mike Sweeney won last weekend at Lawton, Oklahoma. Now that was a race marked by spectacular flips. We're going to go to the heat race action first. Take a close look as Texan Richard Summers gets too close. He's going to catch the other guy's wheel and go end over end. You think that hurts? Well, ask Californian Jeff Haywood. Trying to nail down a spot in the main event, Haywood rushes to the checkered flag, clips the third place man, and somersaults down the straightaway into the darkness. Finally, time for the feature race. It goes just one lap before Indiana's Larry Rice gets into the fence and barrel rolls across the racetrack. Despite all that excitement, nobody was hurt. World of Outlaws sprint car standings. Old rivals Sammy Swindell and Steve Kinzer in another tight battle. Kinzer won last Friday night in Illinois and then ran second to Swindell on Saturday in Indiana. Coming up, Water Racing's hottest ticket. Nevada was a Wild West mining town. The local sheriff had his hands full, keeping order. Well, last weekend, Virginia City hosted its 15th annual Through the Streets Motorcycle Grand Prix, and Sheriff Bob DiCarlo, who's also a racer, says keeping the peace was no problem. We don't have any problem with them. We love to see them come. They have a great time. We have a great time. Sheriff Bob carries number 53, and he suffered a bit of a bad start in the novice old-timers class. The feature race saw 400 riders battle the rugged terrain around Virginia City. Nine-time Baja winner Larry Rossler came from 43rd starting spot to edge defending pro-class champ Anthony Pasqualito. 
Now, Sheriff Bob finished his race despite ignition problems, a broken exhaust, a flat tire, and a crash. He candidly admits he's not ready to give up his squad car for a motorcycle. I hope it never comes to the point where I have to chase somebody down with this thing. I don't think I could catch them. Meanwhile, the Camel Pro Series dirt track stars at historic Ascot Park last weekend, one of them had a tough night. The 1979 national champion Steve Eklund came off hard in his heat race and was hit by his machine. Despite first appearances, Eklund uninjured, but he missed a 20-lap main event that had a great finish. Last lap now, Ted Booty inside takes the lead away from Doug Chandler. Booty, with a great charge, had run Chandler down from way behind. Desperate Doug drives it hard into turn three. Maybe a little contact right there, but as the two privateer Hondas charge off turn four, Booty hangs on for his first win of the year. Fourth place, Schobert extends his point lead over Scotty Parker, who settled for 11. And now we go to the Indy 500 pole story, and it's a good one. Pancho Carter and his crew took another team's throwaway motor and turned the fastest pole speed in the history of the world's biggest race. The story begins last fall, and Jerry Garrett filed this report. Poncho Carter says he really knows how to impress a car owner. This was his debut for the Gallus Racing Team last year. Impressive? You bet. Well, Carter was impressive in a much more cost-effective way in one of Rick Gallus's cars last weekend at Indy. He won the pole position with a record speed of 212.5 miles an hour. Twelve years ago, Carter was Indy's Rookie of the Year. This is his best showing since then. Oh, it sure is. It uh, feels great to be there, and uh, now that we've got the pole under our belt, the next thing we want to win is the race here at the end of the month. That could be a tall order. Carter is powered by a Buick engine, a power plant that's notoriously unreliable. Well, I think that reputation is uh, going by the wayside. The actual engine itself uh, is pretty reliable. Some of the uh, systems that we've been having problems with, the water and the oil system, uh, have given us some problems. But I really, really do feel that the internal pieces are going to stay together. Well, regardless of what happens in this race, Pancho Carter knows that he is $87,000 richer for winning this pole position. In addition, that record-breaking performance earns Pancho Carter distinction as our champion spark plug racer of the week. He's in the running for a Honda Nighthawk motorcycle that goes to our racer of the year. Well, Pancho's Buick surprised a lot of people, but not the Indianapolis Buick dealers. They ran this ad in the paper the morning before qualifying. And yes, it's true, driver Howdy Holmes people gave the engine to Pancho's crew because they couldn't get it to run. And we think our Wrangler U.S. Air Force Reserve Behind the Scenes Award ought to go to the Gallus Racing Team for finding the bugs and turning a reject motor into a winner. A new outfit from Wrangler goes to the crew chief, Mike Dell. While the Indy 500 is running, Charlotte Motor Speedway is going to be hosting a sellout next weekend, and Chris Economaki has more on that story. Over the years, there have been some superstars in sports, Babe Ruth in baseball, Muhammad Ali in boxing, Joe Namath in football. Well, stock car racing now has a new superstar in Bill Elliott, a man who dominated the field of Daytona and has had success after success since then. And now a week from tomorrow here at the Charlotte Motor Speedway, he has a chance to win a million dollar bonus in one afternoon. And that has resulted in ticket sales. With me is Humpy Wheeler, president of this grand and glorious Charlotte Motor Speedway. Humpy, what kind of an effect has Elliott's performance done on your business? Well, just like Ali Frazier, it's been tremendous, Chris, because uh, here a guy from North Georgia that's not supposed to be able to do what he's done is come in and beat the establishment, and the people love Bill. They love him in the way that they did Richard Petty, but maybe double because of the exposure stock car racing is going to get. It's had a tremendous impact on us. We'll have more than 150,000 people here for the Coca-Cola World 600, and frankly, if we had 50,000 more good seats, I think we could sell every one of them. So Bill Elliott is the biggest ticket seller in stock car racing today. Well, I'd say so, and Bob Varsha will have more on stock car racing when Motor Week continues. Motor Speedway, where the Camel GT cars run live on TBS Sports tomorrow, and the Grand National Stockers go next weekend. Meanwhile, in Dover, Delaware, Terry Labonte has the Winston Cup pole for tomorrow's event up there, and Bob Varsha has a rundown on last weekend stock car action. A wild weekend of stock car action opens Saturday night at Shasta Speedway in California with the Winston West Pepsi-Cola 150. Two-time series champ Jim Robinson drove his Oldsmobile number 78 with a case of the flu and a cockpit full of carbon monoxide from a leaky exhaust. Last lap, Herschel McGriff rushes up on the outside, and the groggy Robinson drifts into him. 
Robinson suddenly realizes where he is and wins a drag race to the finish by inches. Then, after taking the checkered flag, the exhausted Robinson passes out and slams the wall in turn one. Robinson was pulled from the car and told he had won, then was treated and released at a local hospital. McGriff's runner-up finish vaults him into a tie with Robinson atop the season point standings, while fourth-place point man Bound came away from Shasta with a new track lap record. In Nashville, Tennessee, Saturday night, a handful of Grand National stars turned out for the All-Pro Folgers 200. With four laps to go, Joe Rutman leads Mike Alexander and Rusty Wallace. Alexander suddenly loses it, tags the wall, and with a little help from behind, flips over for a long slide down the backstretch. Wallace took over from Rutman on the restart to take the win. In New England Sunday, the NASCAR North Coors Tour stopped at Thunder Road Speed Bowl in Vermont, and shortly into the Thunder 100, just about everybody stopped. On lap 37, Randy LaJoy in number 07 took control, leading the rest of the way to win over defending series champ Robbie Crouch and early season points leader Joey Carafas. The win means LaJoy bumps Carafas out of the top spot on the points, with Crouch edging into the top five. Finally to Michigan for the first visit to Kalamazoo Speedway by the ASA Late Model Series. Mark Martin put his Thunderbird number two on the pole, captured the lead on lap 60, and held off four other cars through 300. Martin thus becomes the third different winner in as many ASA events this season, all Thunderbird sweeps. For Motor Week Illustrated, this is Bob Varsha reporting. Got about an hour to go in qualifying up at Indy. No late word on John Paul's situation. He's scheduled to start outside row one here tomorrow. We have learned from Indy that the United States Auto Club, which sanctions the 500, and CART, which sanctions the rest of the IndyCar races, may finally get together on new rules. They could take effect next year, and we hear they will not obsolete this year's cars. And with the Indy 500, a week and a day and away, let's recall one of that race's great moments as Valvoline brings you this edition of Ken Squire's Scrapbook. Hello, everybody. Here's still another page from my great moments in motorsports. May 30th, 1977, Indianapolis, Indiana. A.J. Foyt has been trying for 10 years to become the first man to win the Indy 500 four times. After finishing third and second the two previous years, Foyt leads the 500 with just 17 laps to go. But he must stop for fuel. And as he does, Gordon Johncock streaks past into a 15-second lead. Foyt appears destined to finish second once again, when suddenly, Johncock loses power and coasts helplessly into the infield. A decade of frustration is erased by sudden triumph in 1977 for A.J. Foyt, gathering his history-making fourth win at Indy. I'm Ken Squire. Join me next week for another great moment in motorsports. Well, that's not the Indy 500, but finally today we're going to make our annual trek to the campus of Southern Technical Institute for the bathtub races. That's right, bathtubs. Cast iron, roll rim, claw foot bathtubs, just like grandma's, except these high-tech fraternity and alumni projects have motorcycle engines, disc brakes, rack and pinion steering, and go 90 miles an hour. 14 tubs from as far away as Pennsylvania battled for 75 laps around campus. Track record holder number 15, Edward Jordan, and the pole sitter number 96, Rodney Bridges, found themselves in a two-tub battle. A bathtub pit stop consists of pulling off an empty fuel tank and putting on a new one. And just like the big leagues, that fast pit work won the day. On Jordan's last stop, Bridges grabbed the lead and held on for the win. After taking the checkers, Rodney sits in his tub and thoroughly enjoys a shower of beer. <laughs> And now with the last word on tomorrow's Camel GT here at Charlotte, let's go to Ken Squire and Chris Economaki. Well, let's thump the tub for tomorrow's race, Chris. I would say that here tomorrow, Derek Bell and Al Holbert are the odds-on people to win this race. I don't know what can beat them. Perhaps that Buick V6 on the outside. Well, there's the Jaguars, but don't forget the new Ford Probe. The heavy assets of the Ford Motor Company are behind it, and they're looking for big things from it. Well, that's tomorrow. There'll be some 36 cars rolling off the line. We'll be on the air at 1235 with 13 camera flag-to-flag -flag coverage, onboard camera with Jim Busby's machine. And I think we're in for a spectacular race in this 500-kilometer event. If it's half as good as today's, it'll be a wowzer. All right. Well, let's take one more analysis of what can happen here tomorrow. Bill Alsop starts in a camel light car. We had a car that was an under three liter finish second today. He might end up the overall winner. Well, there's a lot of interest in that light category and many new cars. We had the Nissan crash this morning, and that's going to be a good race within a race. I, don't, I can't see him winning overall, though. Okay, join us tomorrow at 1235 here on the Superstation. David?
Thank you very much, Ken and Chris. We've had pretty good luck on these shows when we go live to the races, picking winners. I think that outside pole sitting Buick is going to win the race. I'll pick John Paul Jr. and Bill Adam tomorrow to finally finish one and win it. We'll be on the air 1235 Eastern Time, 500 kilometers of racing action, Camel GT class right here at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Bill Elliott on Motor Week next Saturday afternoon, and we'll see you then at the same time. <laughs>